Great. Well, again, this morning, as uh, Zach comes to speak to us this morning, he uh, also has with him, he's pretty fortunate, he's got his grandparents and his parents with him this morning. I understand he picked him on the way coming up, uh, up the highway here from South Carolina. So we're glad to have y'all with us this morning. Well, Zach, if you'll come and bring forth what the Lord laid on your heart. Good morning. Y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning, and I do bring greetings. Uh, thank you, brother. I broke my glasses this week, and I can't hardly see in the dark, so uh, I'm glad you turned those on. Uh, it, I do bring you greetings from South Carolina, uh, Great Falls, South Carolina. We're not uh, much bigger. I, I, I don't say that much. I, we're not much bigger than Cleveland, North Carolina. As I was talking to Brother Terry, he told me that you guys have about 700 people in Cleveland, and I think Great Falls, we only run about 2,000. So we're not much bigger in size, but I do bring you greetings from the Second Baptist Church there in Great Falls, South Carolina, where I've been pastor uh, for the last four and a half years. And I did go to school with your pastor, Brother Kessler Ruth, and I do want to just say about him, you're very fortunate. Uh, Kessler is a good man of God. He really is. And uh, Kessler, I remember when we were in school together, uh, everybody knew that Kessler one day was going to pastor a church. And I'll tell you why. Because Kessler was willing uh, to study uh, longer and harder than anybody else. Uh, anytime you'd ever see him, he'd be in the library, he'd be in his room studying. And uh, I can say one thing today about your pastor. I know that each and every time he stands in this pulpit that he is prepared to preach the word of God. And uh, so y'all hang on to him. He's a good young man. And uh, it is an honor to be able to stand in his pulpit today. Uh, I normally have my wife with me and my children, but uh, being that I was just coming up for the morning and heading back, and we have a little girl that's about to turn one year old tomorrow, we kind of thought it would be a, a long ride for her. And uh, so I uh, brought my parents and my grandparents with me. They rode up with us today. So just thank you for having us. I do want to say that before we get into this morning's message. Let's take a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into God's word together. Father, we love you and we want to give you glory and honor for this time that we've had to share together already today. And Lord, as we stood here just a moment ago and sang Amazing Grace, Lord, it is just a great reminder this morning of the grace that you have for us. Though we may be lost and undone in our sin, though we may walk far away from you because of your grace and your mercy and your love and your son Jesus who died on the cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, we today can have a hope beyond the hope that we can be forgiven and have eternal life. Lord, today as we bring this message, God, my heart's not to come with fancy words or with wisdom, but my heart's just to come and to preach the word that you've laid on my heart this week. And Lord, I pray that it might just fall on fertile soil and that hearts and lives might forever be changed by what we hear today. So in the name of your son, Jesus, we say all these things. Amen, amen. and amen. If you'll open your Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of Micah, the Old Testament book of Micah. Uh, if you go to the New Testament, just turn back to your left a little bit into the New Testament, to the Old Testament, uh, about four or five books, you'll run into this. A uh, prophet named Micah. And we're going to be in Micah chapter number 1 this morning. Micah chapter number 1, verse number 1 through verse number 16. When I was growing up as a little boy in South Carolina, and I'm sure many of you grew up the same way as I did, uh, I had a brother, and his name was Willie. And we were the only two. We were siblings. And me and Willie, uh, just like so many little boys growing up in the South, uh, we, would, we would get in our share of trouble. Uh, and some of you young men who are here who have brothers, you know what I mean. Uh, brothers, little boys, two years apart, they like to get in a lot of mischief, right? And uh, my mom and daddy, they're good southern parents who, back then, this is in the 1980s, uh, and they, they were, you know, if we were getting too much trouble, they would give us a good old whooping, right? Now, in today's time, you know, if you give a child a whooping, you're liable to get put in jail. But back then, uh, it was still the way to go. And so my mom and daddy, so we'd get in trouble and they'd whoop us here and there. But I can remember many times my mama and my daddy, after they'd whoop us, they'd like to give us a little talking to and just tell us why we had gotten the whooping and try to correct us for the future. And I can remember my mama saying to me more than, on, on more than one occasion these words, Zach, let this serve as your wake-up call. Anybody ever heard? 
heard your mom or your daddy say those words to you before. Let this serve as your wake-up call. Now, why would my mama say those words to me as a little boy? She would say those words to me and to my brother to let us know that we were walking down the wrong path. We were heading down a path of peril. We were heading down a path of depression. We were heading down a path of heartache. We were heading down a path of ultimate destruction. And so she would want us to know that, hey, listen, because you've gotten in trouble, let this whooping serve as a wake-up call. Change course. Go the other direction. And I believe it's with that same mindset here in the Old Testament book of Micah that this prophet speaks. He's speaking to God's people in this context that we're going to read in a moment. And I believe in the day that he was speaking in, the moment that he was prophesying in, Michael was giving God's people a wake-up call. You're going the wrong path, nation of Israel. You're walking down a path of peril. You're walking down a path of heartache. You're walking down a path of ultimate destruction. And this is your wake-up call. Turn now before it's too late. And it's with that as my backdrop that I bring this message to you this morning entitled, A Wake-Up Call for the Church. A Wake-Up Call for the Church. Now, I want to say before we read this text this morning, I do not come here this morning with a mean spirit. I do not come this morning in anger. I do not come this morning to, to just whip you and send you out of here. I come in here this morning, and I will say some tough things today. I come in this morning with a heavy heart, a heart filled with sorrow and a heart filled with grief as we look at the church today. All week long, I promise you, Brother Terry, I have prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed. I, I've, I've, I've asked God, I've pleaded with God, let me preach something else. Let me just preach something that will sound a little better, something that will be a little nicer. And all along, God just keeps bringing me back to this text. So I'm not going to apologize for what God's going to say. I just want you to know I come in sorrow, not anger. And I come in love, hoping, hoping that maybe today something would stir in your heart. And, let, and this would be a wake-up call. And that the church, we would change direction from the way we're heading today. Read with me, if you will, Micah chapter 1, verse 1 through 16. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morshite. What he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Verse number 2. Listen, Micah says. Listen, all you peoples. Pay attention, earth. Pay attention, everyone in it. The Lord God will be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is <clears throat> leaving his place and coming down to trample the heights of the earth. The mountains will melt beneath him and the valleys will split apart like wax near a fire, like water cascading down a mountainside. All of this, verse 5, Micah says, all of this, all of this judgment that we've just seen before us in the first four verses, all of this will happen. Why? Because of Jacob's rebellion and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Isn't it Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Isn't it Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the countryside, a planting area for a vineyard. I will roll her stones into the valley, and I will expose her foundations. All her carved images will be smashed to pieces. All her wages will be burned in the fire, and I will destroy all her idols. Since she collected the wages of a prostitute, they will be used again for a prostitute. Verse 8, Micah now begins to weep over the sins of the nation of Israel. Because of this, Micah says, I will lament. And I will wail. I will walk barefoot and naked. I will howl like the jackals. I will mourn like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable and has reached even Judah. It has approached the gates of my people as far as Jerusalem. Don't announce it in Gath and don't weep at all. 
Roll in the dust in Beth Leopher. Depart in shameful nakedness, you residents of Shafir, the residents of Zain, and will not come out. Beth is is lamenting its support is taken from you, though the residents of Morab anxiously await for something good. Disaster has come from the Lord to the gates of Jerusalem. Harness the horses to the chariot, you residents of Lachish. This was the beginning of sin for daughter Zion, because Israel's acts of rebellion can be traced to you. Therefore, send farewell gifts to Morshath Gath. The houses of Agzim are a deception to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror against you who live in Marashah. The nobility of Israel will come to Adalam. Verse 16. Shave your head, shave yourselves bald, and cut off your hair in sorrow for your precious children. Make yourselves as bald as an eagle, for they have been taken in the exile. I don't believe if I stand here this morning were to ask for a show of hands, and I'm not going to ask for them this morning. But if I were to ask for a show of hands this morning, I believe 100% of you this morning at First Baptist Cleveland, I believe 100% of you would raise your hand and say you're discouraged over the course that our country is headed. See, a lot of you are already nodding heads. I believe many of you, if you are like me, you this morning are heartbroken over the days and the times in which we live. We live in perilous times. We live in depressing times. We live in wicked times. My grandfather always reminds me, he says, Zach, we live in days where people say wrong is right and right is wrong. I heard somebody say the other day these words. They said, Brother Zach, if America doesn't repent, if America doesn't turn back, we're going to face the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Upon which I replied, I said, no, we won't suffer the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they said, what do you mean? I said, our judgment will be far worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, they didn't have the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the cross. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have Jesus, but we in America do, and we rebel against him day after day after day, and our judgment will be far worse than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. So we sit today, and all of us today, in the church of God, we living are living in perilous times, wicked times, evil days, and what are we as Christians? How are we supposed to handle these days? What are we supposed to do in the midst of all this? What can we do? Are there actions we can take that would maybe cause God to once again send a great revival and a great awakening to this country? Well, I believe the answer is found right here in the book of Micah. I believe Micah has given us four places that he tells us to wake up. Four places that he's telling the church this morning to wake up before it's too late. First of all, I believe that Micah is telling us today, wake up and remember your God. Wake up and remember your God. As we look at this text this morning, we have to understand that this is written 2,800 years ago. We have to understand that Micah is speaking to the nation of Israel, to the house of Judah. He's speaking to a people who they knew God. There's no doubt that this people, they knew who God was. Think of their history for a moment. When you think of the history of the nation of Israel, of the people of Judah, what's in their history? Well, you can trace it all the way back really to the very beginning, all the way back to Adam and Eve. But let's just start with Abraham for a moment. God calls a man named Abraham out of an idol-worshipping society and says, I want you to leave there and go to a land that I've promised you, and I will give you an offspring greater than the stars of the sky. There's only one problem. His wife was barren, and he was 75 years old at the time he was called, and his wife was 65. But God told him to go, and Abraham knew this is what God told me to do. So Abraham left. He and his family to go to this land they had never seen, but just in faith to follow God to where he was telling them to go. Believing that God would give them a miracle, would give them a son, a promised child that would bless the entire earth. Amen. 
Years went by and years went by. And you know the story. It never came to pass until Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. God gives him a child named Isaac. And sometime later, what does God say? Take that son, that little boy that I promise you, that little boy that I love. And take him up the mountain and sacrifice him to me. Can you imagine? Abraham takes that little boy. The book of Hebrews tells us that he believed that God was even able to raise him from the dead. If he would sacrifice him. As they're walking up that mountain, oh Isaac, what does he say? He says, Daddy, we, we, we've, got the, we've got the tools, we've got the equipment, we've got the wood, but we don't have the lamb. Now Abraham said those words, God will provide himself a lamb. Amen. And we know the story, how it goes right when Isaac's about to put the dagger into his neck. An angel, the Lord, the angel, the Lord shouts and says, Abraham, Abraham. And there's a ram caught in the thicket. That's the history of the nation of Israel. It goes on with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And then we get to a man named Moses. Who was supposed to be dead. Because when he was born he was supposed to be killed. But because he had a loving mama and some midwives. Who feared God more than they feared the Pharaoh. They kept him alive. And they put him in a little basket. And they sent him out on the river. And he ended up in Pharaoh's daughter's house. Raised in the education of the Egyptians, skilled in their wisdom, well spoken, other than a stuttering problem, we know that, but he had a lot of wisdom about him. And old Moses, what does he do? He, he kills an Egyptian one day, buries him in the sand, the next day he's caught, he runs away, and 40 years later, God speaks out of a burning bush and says, Go back to Egypt. Tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses goes back. And you remember the plagues. And then finally the tenth plague, the Passover, is there. And the, the, the Egyptians let them go. And all the Israelites, they go out. And they get down there to the Red Sea. And what happens at the Red Sea? But the Egyptians come crashing down on top of them. And they begin to say, hey, Moses, it was better in Egypt than it is out here. And Moses says what? Those famous words, just stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. He raises that staff in the Red Sea parts and they walk across on dry land. When they get to the other side, the Red Sea closes in on top of the forces of, uh, of Pharaoh and the Egyptian army behind them and they all die in the sea. That's the history of the nation of Israel. The history of the nation of Israel contained a young man named Joshua who well long after Moses, they went to Jericho, come up against that, that wicked place, that huge wall that could not be broken down. And God said, Joshua, march your people around this wall six times or one time a day for six days. And on the seventh day, march around seven times. And on the seventh time, let your trumpets blast and, and shout. And the walls will come down and you will possess the land. And Joshua and the nation of Israel did just that. On the seventh day, they marched seven times and they shouted and the walls came. And they took the promised land. That's the nation Israel. That's the history of this nation. That same Joshua sometime later was in a war and he needed the sun to stand still. And he prayed and he said, God, if you just make that sun stand still, we could win this battle. And the Bible tells us that the sun stood still for an entire day. That's the history of this nation. And the history of this nation included a young shepherd boy named David. Who stood against a giant named Goliath from Gath and in faith with one stone and a sling killed the giant. This nation also had the wisest and richest king to ever live, King Saul. This nation also had prophets like Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, Daniel. They had men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had Elijah. They had Elijah. They had them all. We can say for certain today that this nation knew God. Amen. Yet in the day that Micah prophesied, and they had social respect, economic affluence, and prosperity that they had never had before. Peace on every side. But, but, they were in the depths of moral corruption. The same people who had all this history in the day of Micah 
were living in open sin and rebellion and wickedness to God. Spiritual decay, spiritual decadence, moral corruption, evil on every side. The hearts of men plotting evil every moment of the day. And it's with that as our backdrop that the prophet Micah speaks. In the midst of the evil, in the midst of the wickedness, Micah speaks. And he says what? Verse 2. Listen. Listen to all you peoples and listen all you earth and everyone in it. The Lord will be a witness against you. Before Micah gets into any other detail. Anything else about the sins of the house of Israel before he calls them out on their wickedness, on their corruption, he simply points their eyes toward God. Remember him? Remember the one that you're offending? Remember the one who brought us to this place? Do you remember him? It's almost as if Micah is saying, oh, if you don't, let me just remind you of who he is. He's the one who is eternal. He's the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the one who dwells in unapproachable light. He's the one who is robed in glory. He's the one who is worshipped by the heavenly host. He's the one who is holy. He's the one who is almighty. He's the one who's omnipresent. He's the one who's omnipotent. He's the one who's omniscient. He's the one who's omnibenevolent. He's the one who is majestic. He is the one who hung the stars in the sky and calls them all by name. He's the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hand. Do you remember him? If you don't remember that he's the one who told Job, I set the boundaries of the ocean and the lightning bolts report to me and ask, where should we go to next? He's the one who is consumed with anger over your sin. Amen. Amen. But he's also the one who's loving. He's also the one who's merciful. And he's also the one who's compassionate. And whose essence is love. Do you remember it? In case you don't, let me call your attention to all he's done for us. He's created us. He's chosen us. He's set us apart as a testimony to the world. He has delivered us. He has provided for us. He has protected us. He has promised us more than we can ever imagine. He has destroyed armies before and behind us. He has given us strength to endure the hardest times. He has walked through the lowest valleys with us, and he has led us when we've been on the mountaintops. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is God. He alone is God, my friends. And his chosen people, we need to take a minute, wake up, and remember him. It's almost as if Micah is saying, look, these streets may be lined with idols, and we may have social affluence, and we may have prosperity on every side, but remember where this comes from. It didn't come from some wood and, and, uh, and metal idol lining the street. Instead, it came from God. Amen. What a message for the church this morning. In the midst of the peril, in the midst of the hard times, in the midst of the wickedness that we live, friends, we need to wake up and remember God. Amen. I saw on the screen a moment ago Billy Graham's quote. I've read the back of the book, and God wins. Do you really know that to be true this morning? See, I tra I've traveled the world preaching this book, and one thing I can say for certain, I believe the majority of churches today have forgotten God. And I don't say that with joy in my heart. I believe in the majority of churches today, if God were to walk out the front door, most churches would not even realize he had left the building. They'd just keep on business as usual. Do you remember him this morning, First Baptist Cleveland? Do you remember that first time you ever called your name? Do you remember that day that you heard him speak to your heart for the very first time. Do you remember that day when he created in you something new? 
Do you remember that day when in his power and his glory and his might he reached down in your spiritual deadness and gave you newness of life? Do you remember him this morning, old church? We need to remember God. Today, more than ever, we need to remember God. Micah, before he goes anywhere else, says, guys, we need to wake up. And we need to remember God. But there's a second thing Micah says, and that's this. We need to wake up. We need to wake up and recognize our sin. We need to wake up and recognize our sin. Now, I know preaching on sin today is not a very popular thing to do in our time anymore. If you don't believe that today, just go watch your television channels and I know some of you are probably on Facebook and social media. Me and my granddaddy was talking about this with my parents on the way up here, talking about Franklin Graham. And I praise God for Billy Graham, and I praise God for Franklin Graham. In the midst of the wickedness that we live in today, Franklin Graham is one voice who's standing up for the truth. Amen. Now you listen to me. Sin's not popular to preach on anymore. How do I know? Because the greatest pastors in America today, you never hear them mention it. You never hear them coming out on television and condemning these things. Why? Because they know to do so would cost them money. They knew to do so would cost them popularity. They knew to do so would cost them the church. They don't preach on sin anymore. I know sin's not very popular to preach on, but friends, listen to what the Bible says. Micah says we need to wake up and remember our sin. Verse 3 through 7, look, the Lord is leaving his place. And he's coming down to trample the heights of the earth. The mountains will melt beneath him. The valleys will split apart like wax near a fire, like water cascading down a mountainside. And this will happen because of Jacob's rebellion and the sins of the house of Israel. As I stand here this morning, I'm reminded that Micah is preaching, prophesying. To the entire world about their sin. Right? Wrong. He's not preaching and prophesying to the world. He's preaching and prophesying to God's people. What does he say? Because of the sins and the rebellion of Jacob. These are God's chosen people that Micah is prophesying and preaching to. And this is where I have a heavy heart today. Micah is speaking, preaching, prophesying to the people who have been chosen by God, the people who God had made covenants with, the people who knew him and saw all those things that we mentioned just a little bit, a, a little bit ago. Yes, these were the people that Micah was prophesying to, and he was letting them know that their sins had infuriated a holy God. I suppose I could come in today, and I could get amens, and I could get hallelujahs, and I could get several pats on the back. If I stood here in this pulpit today and I said, America, America, oh, how you need to repent of your homosexuality. I suppose I could get amens and hallelujahs if I said, America, America, you need to repent of your idolatry. America, America, you need to repent over the way that you've turned your back and your heart on God. America, oh America, you need to repent of your wasteful spending. America, America, you need to repent of your moral decay. I could even get amens and hallelujahs, especially if I called out the president and said he needs to repent this morning. But friends, there's only one problem. That's not who Micah is calling out. Micah is calling out the people of God. And I wonder this morning if Micah were here at First Baptist Cleveland this morning, standing in this pulpit, would he call out the sins of the church? Would he call us out on our hypocrisy? How we come in with one mask on Sunday morning, 
holy roller, Bible thumper, know everything about it. But on Monday, if we saw you at work, you'd be living like you were. Coming here each and every Sunday, happy and excited to be in the house of God, smiling to everyone, yet going home and finding yourself on some pornography website. Living with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. I wonder if he would call out our lukewarmness this morning. That we're neither hot nor cold. We're just somewhere right in the middle. I wonder if Michael would stand here this morning and say these words. Church, remember what God said. He said in the book of Revelation, because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, he wants to vomit you out of his mouth. You make him sick. I wonder if he'd call out our complacency. The fact that we have a lot of good intentions, a lot of good ideas, we just never do anything about it. Jesus gave us the great commission, go to the ends of the earth and baptize and make disciples. What have you done about it lately? You know you have a lost brother or sister. You know you have a lost son or daughter. You know you have a lost neighbor, but you never even speak when they pass by. Knowing that they're going to hell, knowing that they're lost, and yet you're complacent in reaching them with the gospel. I wonder, listen, I wonder if he would call out the sins from the pulpit. How our leaders, how our preachers today are as corrupt and as evil as those who are sitting in the pews. How our preachers today, every time you turn on the television, are caught with some prostitute or caught in some sexual sin, touching some little boy or some little girl. I wonder if he'd call us out as, as leaders that we say it's not okay to be drunk, but then we go and we drink beer ourselves. I wonder if he'd call out our deacons who say I'm qualified because I give 10% and I've never been divorced, but they're not full of the spirit or grace. I wonder if he'd call out our leaders. I wonder if he'd call out our idolatry. How we worship our traditions instead of him. How we worship our pastor instead of him. How we worship our worship leaders instead of him. And we're consumed with idolatry. Loving the things of the world. Loving our fancy homes. Loving our cars more than we love him. Don't you see today, friends, we're not much better than the house of Israel. It's God's people that Micah is calling out. Think of just how much we really resemble them. We have more than we ever had. We have bigger buildings. Thanks to your equipment. We have peace and freedom all around us. And yet on the inside. We're filled with corruption and decay. Externally, our facilities are clean. Y'all going to get a brand new parking lot. Praise God. I need one at Second Baptist. Send some of that funds my way. We have fancier buildings. Everything looks good on the outside externally, but internally. We have less power than we've ever had before. If we're going to see true change in our country, if we're going to see true revival, many of you are like me, you've been praying for revival. If we're going to see these things in our midst, Brother Terry, the church must wake up, remember God, and secondly, wake up and recognize her sin. But recognizing our sin is not enough. There's a third thing that we must do. The third wake-up call that Micah gives us. Micah says we must wake up and remember God. We must wake up and recognize our sin. But thirdly, we must wake up and repent. We must wake up and repent. Listen, just recognizing sin and doing nothing about, nothing about it isn't enough. We must go further. We must turn away from the sin that we find ourselves in. We must repent. Listen, this time of year, churches begin to plan for fall revival, right? This is that time of year where you go ahead and you hire a speaker to come in and to give you and host for you a series of revival meetings. And during that time, Brother Kessler will do it. I'll do it. 
We stand up to our people and we quote 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It's a beautiful verse. Beautiful promises. We love to quote that verse leading up to revival. Preachers have been quoting it since the Great Awakening in America. They've been quoting it all the way back since the days of King Solomon. And in our day and time, preachers quote it day after day, month after month, year after year, in churches across our land. And guess what? Nothing happens. Why? Because if we really are going to admit it, we don't really want revival, a true movement of God. What we want is our Americanized version of revival. A four-day series of meetings is going to fan the flame down deep in my heart. It's going to get me stirred up to just go six more months. And then we'll have another four or five day series of meetings and we'll do it all over again. We don't really want true heaven sent revival. Why? Because we're not really willing to do what it takes to see true heaven sent revival. How do I know? Because I see it back home in my own church, in my own community. Every year in October, we have big community revival. 28 churches come together to have one big tent revival in the middle of our town. Every year, one week before that revival starts, we have this big prayer meeting where everybody comes together to pray over the weeks, uh, the, the, the next week's activities. And we always have one pastor from town give a devotion, just a short devotion, because we're there to dedicate ourselves to prayer. I'll never forget four years ago, Reverend Greg Batchelor, who was then the pastor of First Baptist in Great Falls, he stood up and he pronounced this verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He quoted that verse, he preached that verse, and made an impassioned plea that we would repent and turn back to God. And as that took place, we walked out onto the ground so where we'd have the revival. And as we stood on those grounds, I got down on my knees. I was stirred on the inside by what he said. I knew I had sin in my heart. I knew I needed to repent before a holy God. And so there I got down on my knees out there on that grass, and I began to pray. And within five minutes, I heard cars cranking, people laughing, people talking. And within seven minutes, only myself, that pastor, and one other pastor was left out of about 400 people that had showed up that day. Why is that? Because we're not really willing to do what it takes to gain revival, to see true spiritual change. We want to be like Moses. You see, we want to take our sin and we want to bury it underneath the desert floor. Moses thought after he killed that Egyptian, if I just bury it, nobody will know about it. But what if this morning your sin that you have buried underneath the desert floor, your sin that is festering down in your heart, that rotten carcass of sin that is down deep inside of you, what if God began to blow the sand off of the floor of your deserted heart? And that old piece of sin that you've got laying down deep, what if all of a sudden it came to the surface and it was exposed for the whole world to see and God told you to repent? And if you would just repent, he would send revival. He would send change. Would you really want everybody knowing the sin down deep in your life? What if God showed up this morning? And he told you, husband, before this service is over, during the invitation, you have something that you did behind your wife's back. 
And I want you to look at your wife, and I want you to ask her forgiveness. And I want you to repent. Would you be willing? Would you be willing? If that's what it meant to have revival, would you be willing to look at your wife and tell her what you did behind her back? What if God showed up this morning and got a hold of this church service? And he told you, remember that person across the aisle who did you wrong all those years ago? Who you've been harboring bitterness towards and you won't even shake their hand or look at them on Sunday morning? What if God got a hold of your heart this morning and told you to go across that aisle? To take that brother or sister by the hand and say, look, you wronged me, I wronged you, but let's let it be settled this day. God told me to repent and ask for forgiveness. Would you be willing? What if God said that's all that was holding him up moving? Would you be willing? What if God showed up in this house this morning and convicted you of your complacency? He said, today, before the day is over, I want you to go to your neighbor, your lost son or daughter, and I want you to tell them about me. And I don't want you to hold anything back. Don't worry about offending them. Just tell them the truth. You have been complacent and you are in sin. How many of you would be willing to repent and say, okay, I'll do whatever it takes? What if God really showed up this morning and began to move in this place and to blow his spirit across your heart and your sin were to come to the surface? Would you be willing to do what it takes to see true heaven sent? Revival. We say we're willing, but are we really? Three years ago, down there in Great Falls, we had a big mission team that came to town from Bat Cave Baptist. That whole week they were there, Brother David McCaffrey, who's their pastor, preached a crusade that entire weekend. If you've never heard David preach, I think he's the best preacher in all the world. David, that first night, Brother Terry, he preached and he preached. And he preached, and nobody moved. That second night, David preached, and he preached, and he preached, and nobody moved. That third night, he preached, and he preached, and he preached, and nobody moved. And I went home that night, and I sat in my chair, and I was with my brother-in-law, Jack. And Jack sitting across from me, and I said, Jack, I don't understand why nobody's moving. Why isn't somebody coming forward? And right at that moment, God spoke to my heart and said, it's because of you, Zach Williams. It's because you have sin in your life. You're harboring bitterness toward a brother in Christ, and you need to make it right. And I said, Lord, he doesn't even know what I've said about him behind his back. He doesn't know how I've run my mouth all over this town to other preachers about him. And Lord, I cannot Go to him and repent. I cannot go and ask for forgiveness. Lord, no way, no how. What will people say about me? I'm the pastor of the church. The person I was holding bitterness toward was my director of missions in Chester County. Because of some things that I disagreed with. And I had just, I had ran his name into the dirt. And I looked across at my brother-in-law, Jack, and I said, Jack, I said, I think God's telling me I'm holding up revival, but man, I can't go to Brother Ted, and I can't say anything to him. What would I look like? And you know what Jack said to me? I looked at Jack, and I said, Jack, I'll just repent to God, and I'll go on. You know what Jack said to me? Jack said, Zach, true repentance spawns action. That night I got on the phone, it was one in the morning, I called Brother Ted. He didn't answer, so I waited until the next morning. The next morning, I called him on the phone, and I said, Ted, i got to tell you something, brother. I've wronged you. I've ran your name in the ground to every pastor in town, and I'm so sorry for what I've done. Brother Ted began to weep on the other end of the phone. You know what he said to me? He said, Zach, I've always known you're a man of God, and today only confirms it. I forgive you, brother. That night, Brother David got up in that revival meeting, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached. And when the altar call was given that night, for an hour and a half, people came to that altar, repented, were saved, went across the aisles to each other, 
embraced each other, forgave each other for bitterness and past sins and past hurts, told husbands and wives past sins, and we saw great healing in our community because God stirred the winds of revival. What if he showed up this morning and brought that sin down deep in your heart to the surface? Would you be willing to repent? Would you be willing to do whatever it takes? See, we say we won't change. We won't revival. We want God to move. And he says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I would heal their land. He tells us all we have to do is humble ourselves, seek his face, pray, and turn from our wicked ways. What does repent mean? Repent means to turn. Are we willing, church, to repent? Micah says, wake up, remember God, wake up and recognize your sin. Wake up and repent. Now, friends, let me ask you a question this morning. What happens if we don't? What happens if this morning you simply say, you know what? I hear the warning. I hear what the preacher's preaching. I hear what he's saying. But I'm just going to go on about my business. I'll go on my own way. I'm not going to do what he says to do. What happens if we don't heed the wake of call? I suppose we'll suffer the repercussions. Listen to verse 16. What does Micah say? Micah says, shave yourself bald. Cut off your hair in sorrow for your precious children. Make yourselves as bald as an eagle. For they have been taken from you into exile. Just before that, in verse number 8, Micah said, Because of this, I will lament and I will wail. I'll walk barefoot and I'll walk naked and I will howl like the jackals and I will mourn like ostriches, for her wound is incurable and has reached even Judah. It has been as approached the gate of my people as far as Jerusalem. Micah, he was remembering God. He recognized sin and in his own heart, he knew there had to be repentance that took and Michael laments and he wails and he mourns over the sins of God's people. Where's that mourning this morning? Where's that lamenting? Where's that sorrow over the sins of God's people? This altar probably, I would venture to say, I don't know. I've only talked to your pastor briefly. He has not told me anything about you. But I would venture to say this is probably the least visited place in this whole church. You spend hours in Sunday school rooms. You spend hours in fellowship halls. You spend hours in women's meetings. You spend hours in men's meetings. And then you spend two to three minutes here a week. Where's the mourning over sin? Friends, if we don't mourn, if we don't repent, we'll suffer the repercussions. What's he say? See, Micah in this moment could see what his people couldn't see. God had given him a vision that there was an army called the Assyrians. And they were assembling for battle. And they were coming against the nation of Israel. This wicked nation, these wicked Assyrians were coming against the people of God to take them into captivity. God had tried every other means to wake them up. And they would not listen. So finally God is telling Micah, listen, your children have been taken from you into captivity. The Assyrians are coming, and they will lead you out with hooks in your noses, and you will go into captivity just like you were in Egypt. And there in captivity, maybe you'll finally call on my name. Micah could see down the road that there was a, another empire named, named the Babylonians with their king, Nebuchadnezzar. Micah could see it in his mom's eye. And it was as if Micah was telling them, look, the Babylonians are one day coming, and they're coming to this place, and they will take us into captivity. And it will be even worse than when Israel went. The, 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 the nation of Judah, when we go, we'll see Solomon's temple burned to rubble, and we'll see the smoke rising, and we'll remember at that point that we have sinned against the holy God. Because of our sin that God is having to take us to this place. And here's what I fear, church. Here's what I fear. 
throughout the Bible. You go look it up for yourself. Throughout the Bible, every great revival comes by means of persecution. Aside from maybe one or two, like Jonah or somebody like that, I'm sure you can find one or two, but the majority of great revivals, especially in the New Testament with the church, when God's people are persecuted, the church is revived, and his message goes forth. Over in Romania, where I go every year, I met a pastor there one time. This is what he told me. He said, Zach, when it was illegal to be a Christian in Romania, we could have an underground church service out in the forest in the middle of the night where we had to worship and preach in a whisper. And we could have almost sometimes 1,000 to 1,500 people meeting in secret to worship Jesus, knowing that we could be thrown in prison and die. And when the Iron Curtain fell and the dictator was put out and it was finally we were free to be Christians in our country, he said, now we struggle to get a hundred people in the door each and every week. Here's my fear. Church, if we don't repent, if we don't remember God, recognize our sin and repent, my fear is that God would have to send us underground. That we would have to go into some sort of persecution that we've never had to deal with before in our country. All so that we would finally turn our faces to him. You said that can't happen, Brother Zach. We live in America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. That can't happen to us. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. If God would do it to the house of Israel, his chosen people, do you not think he'd do it to his bride? I stand here today to tell you that just this week, there was a man. Y'all know the Supreme Court rule that come down two weeks ago. I don't even want to get into it. But all I want to say to you is this. There was a man this week, homosexual man, sued a publishing company in New York City, $70 million, because they're printing Bibles with homosexual passages in them that condemn homosexuality and they offend him. He's suing that company in the hopes that every publishing company in America will have to stop printing the verses of homosexuality in the Bible. Friends, I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'm not a prophet, but I'll just go ahead and tell you. He's going to win. He's absolutely 100% going to win. He won't win the ultimate battle. We know who wins that. But he will win. That's where our country's headed. Friends, before long, there'll be people telling your pastor, Brother Kessler Roof, if you preach against sin, if you preach against homosexuality, it's a hate crime, and we're going to put you in prison. You know there was a pastor in Vermont this week that was locked up for one year for not marrying a homosexual couple. It's coming, church. We've prayed for revival. We've asked God to send it. What if this is his means? Because we as his people have failed to do what he says we must do. I fear that if we don't wake up now and repent, it may be too late. But maybe today, oh God, is there still hope? That if we repent, if I stand before you, Lord, this morning on behalf of this church and behalf of this people and call on your name and pray, then maybe you would withhold the judgment that's coming against us? God, would you withhold the Judgment is coming against your people because we fail to heed the warning and the wake up call. Friends, my fear is that if we don't turn back now, all of us in this room are going to have to face it. I talked to my brother Terry beforehand. He told me this morning that this is an old farming community. I love that. That's the place I grew up. Right between York and Rock Hill, South Carolina, a little place called Terza. Just an old farming community. We've never had to deal with what we're dealing with today, have we? We've never had to deal with such hatred toward the church. We've never had to deal with such anger toward the people of God. Would we finally wake up and see that while we're waiting on the White House to repent, it's God's house that needs to repent. Mm -hmm. 
We can't expect the outside world to ever change until the inside of God's house is purified. Mm -hmm. right. Friends, I call you this morning to remember God, to recognize your sin, to repent or suffer the repercussions. We're going to have a time of invitation. I suppose I could stand up here and preach two more hours. I'm just getting started. But I believe with peace in my heart that I've said all that needs to be said this morning. It's in your court now. In just a little bit of time, I'll shake your hand. Me and my grandparents and my parents will hit the road and we'll head back down to South Carolina. And you'll be left with the message that you heard this morning. What are you going to do with it? Could it be that maybe God has sent me up here today? So that true change in our country could start right here this morning with the people at First Baptist Cleveland, North Carolina. It's got to start somewhere. Would you come this morning as the invitation is given? I'll ask you to stand. Brother, uh, Brother Terry, you ask me to handle the invitation for you today. If you'll stand, this altar's open this morning. Father God, we love you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We pray, Lord, that this word today is fallen on fertile soil, and that God, our hearts will forever be changed. God, I just give you these next few moments. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Maybe you've heard